How does an antique dealer attribute and research an antique sword? Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, but also Eastern Antique Arms. And uh, for the purposes of this video, actually, I'll be making quite a lot of reference to this particular sword and the process which I go through in order to attribute, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second, attribute a sword to a specific officer. Now, in the case of this specific sword, uh, this is actually on the website currently uh, for sale, and it's been researched. Um, so I, uh, in fact, it happened on Tuesday night. It was two nights ago. I'm filming this on a Thursday. Uh, two nights ago, I spent a few hours trying to pin down who exactly owned this sword. Now, the reason I'm using this uh, specific sword for this video uh, and why I'm making this video now is because uh, that process went uh, basically perfectly. And I should say that this process often doesn't go perfectly. And I have many swords in my collection, which uh, due to various details of the on the sword, I should uh, in theory have been able to attribute to an officer, uh, but I have failed to do so quite annoyingly so. And I've got some swords, which I would dearly, dearly love to know who they belong to because of the period they're from or because of their particular designs or regimental attributions, the fact that they're service sharp and that they show signs of campaign use. These sorts of reasons, I would love to know who the officer was that owned and carried that sword, uh, presumably um, on military campaigns. And uh, in some cases, it's just not been possible. And in fact, in the past, I have shown um, a specific sword, which always I always come back to. And every now and again, I have another go at trying to attribute it to uh, trying to find out who the original um, owner was. And I still haven't got there. And uh, one of those examples is a Bengal engineer's officer's sword, which must have been carried around the time of the Sikh Wars or the Indian Mutiny and has seen extensive use, is repeatedly service sharpened. So whoever was carrying it was carrying it in campaign and would have therefore been a very interesting person to research. Uh, but for um, various reasons, I just haven't been able to pin down uh, who, who that uh, belonged to. I've got another example, actually, which is... Uh, uh, behind me right now, a sword down there, which is a Coldstream Guards Officer's Sword, which has a uh, number of identifiable features on it. It's a Wilkinson sword and it's numbered, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second as well. Uh, but for various reasons, I have not been able to pin that down to one of the officers of the um, Coldstream Guards uh, in the time when that sword was made. Now, onto this sword. I won't talk so much about why I haven't been able to attribute some swords. I'm going to talk about how it worked with this one because this is pretty much a textbook um, uh, example, a uh, case study of how to research, in this case, a Wilkinson officer's sword, and this is a cavalry officer's sword. So the very first fundamental thing you want to know about the sword is what type of sword it is and when does it date to. Okay, so what type of sword it is will tell you what regiment or at least what type of regiment that person served in. Is it a light cavalry officer's sword? Is it a heavy cavalry officer's sword? Is it a lifeguards officer's sword? Is it a infantry officer's sword, a Royal Engineers officer's sword? This kind of thing. So you need to know your uh, patterns and models and uh, which models of sword were carried at which times. In this particular case, this is a um, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the fussy details, but it's a light cavalry, it's a Victorian light cavalry officer's sword. Okay, you can see it's in nice condition. Um, it's all solid and sound. It's got good etching. It's uh, in a nice bright condition. Don't worry about me touching the blade. I will, of course, um, uh, oil and wipe off the blade afterwards. So I'm going to poke at the blade here. If you have antique swords or you're handling other people's, remember that unplated blades, just regard all blades as unplated. Uh, if you put your hands on them, your hand contains oils which will uh, not do good things to steel, to, particularly to carbon steel, um, if not um, treated afterwards. It's absolutely fine to touch blades, put your hands all over them, so long as it is going to be cleaned afterwards. And in this case, that means oiled and wiped off. Uh, so this is a Victorian light cavalry officer's sword. Now, in uh, this particular blade is a fullered blade with a so-called spear point, a double-edged spear point with a false edge. So this type of blade came in in 1845. So if this wasn't a numbered Wilkinson, and we'll, again, I'll talk more about numbered Wilkinsons in a second because that's quite intrinsic to this particular sword. Um, I could tell you 
completely categorically that this was a, if this wasn't a numbered Wilkinson, that it's a, a sword that dates to between 1845 and 1896. The reason being that in 1896, um, generally speaking, there is a few exceptions, but generally speaking, cavalry officers got a new type of guard. They actually adopted the heavy cavalry guard. Um, so this is a sword which categorically or certainly on paper, in theory, should date to between 1845 and 1896. Now that's quite a broad, it's a 51 year uh, period. That's quite a broad period. Now uh, you can often narrow that down through expertise. In other words, uh, you can get the general feel of details of a sword. For example, the uh, particular shape of the grip, um, sometimes the shape of the blade, although not really with this uh, 1845 pattern blade because that stayed pretty much the same. Sometimes details of the pommel, sometimes details of the guard design, sometimes uh, details actually of the etching design as well might narrow down that period for you slightly. But it's usually guesswork. So uh, I might, for example, on my website say that a Royal Artillery Officer's sword, which stayed the same pattern for quite a long time, I, I believe it that it dates to the 1870s or 80s, or that I believe it dates to the 1850s or 60s. And that's due to my many, many years, decades, three decades of experience with antique swords, uh, cross-referencing different ones, and just getting a feel for when a, a certain pattern or model, although that pattern or model might have stayed generally the same, when that particular example might date from within that time period. Now, luckily with this particular sword, it's a Wilkinson. Now, Wilkinsons are particular and special uh, in a number of ways, but in one particular way, you will notice that on the back there of the spine of the blade, this is the spine, the back, um, there's a number, a serial number. Now, Wilkinson swords started to be numbered in 1854, the beginning of the year, 1854, and for arbitrary reasons, they decided to start with the number 5,000. So all Wilkinson swords are numbered from 5,000 upwards. Incidentally, that is um, the theory is that it's because Henry Wilkinson believed that they had made approximately 5,000 swords up until that point, uh, and therefore he decided to start at 5,000. Now on my website, linked below, Eastern Antique Arms, I've actually done an analysis of the serial numbers uh, for Wilkinson. So if you have a Wilkinson sword with a number on the spine, I have put all of the Victorian dates up there. And I've also done a bit of uh, gr graphic analysis on Excel to see how many swords they were making per year. And I think that, in all honesty, Henry Wilkinson was probably overstating how many swords they had made uh, between 1844, which is when they started making swords officially, and um, 1854, so in 10 years. Um, I think that 5,000 swords in 10 years is overstating it slightly because, and I, bet, I, I, I say that because it was relatively rare that they made a thousand swords a year after that date, um, with the exception of the Crimean War, when they churned out loads of officers' swords for officers who wanted better swords to go to the Crimean War, or who were coming back from the Crimean War and they'd uh, they decided they wanted better swords or replacement swords for ones that had been rust damaged or broken or whatever. Um, so that was an unusual time, 1854 to 56, the Crimean War. But generally speaking, I don't think Wilkinson were usually making as many as thousand swords per month. And even more so, I definitely don't think they were making that many in the period 1844 to 54, uh, because I think they were making fewer swords before 1845. Uh, Wilk Henry Wilkinson came out with this amazing marketing um, idea to have a new style of blade that he promoted with his connections at Horse Guards and got made into the new regulation. And after that point, his design of blade, the 1845 pattern blade, became regulation for everyone. And uh, the proof disc down here and the proofing method, which uh, Henry Wilkinson also pioneered. So essentially, he kind of cornered the market and made everyone else copy his blade design um, and uh, proofing methods and everything else. And so I think that enhanced Wilkinson's reputation and probably increased the number of uh, the demand and the number of swords that they were making. So I think it's unlikely that they made 5,000 swords before 1854, but that's a tangential point. So coming back to this sword, this has a serial number and that showed me what year this sword was made. Now, 
Given that I now know what year this sword was made, I know that the officer, who is identified in this case by um, some initials and crests on the blade, which we'll look at in, in a minute, um, I know that that officer must have either been starting to serve, in other words, commissioning, commission, commissioning as an officer in that year, or could have been an already serving officer in that year. But regardless, I know that they were serving as an officer in the light cavalry at in that year and and we can presume the year after as well in terms of the records so therefore that massively narrows down what i have to look at i only have to look at light cavalry regiments officers and i only have to look at that year or maybe the year after the reason i say the year after is because someone if they commissioned late say in 1893 they might not appear in the army records for 1893 they might not appear until 1894 because the army lists or records were only published once or twice a year so you should always check the year of the sword and the year after of the sword as well and yes indeed there is occasionally bad luck whereby an officer could, could be commissioned in 1893 late in the year and be dead by the end of the year and never appear in either the 93 or the 94 army list so you have to remember that's always a possibility as well but generally speaking an officer who commissioned in uh, 93 should be in the 93 or 94 army lists so that massively narrowed down who I had searched for. Now, the other thing to mention about the serial numbers for uh, Wilkinson Sword is if you look on the research page of Eastern Antique Arms website, linked below, you can see that there is a contact uh, details there to apply for the proof record for Wilkinson blades, which were kept from 1854 until uh, Wilkinson closed down in the early 2000s. Um, and very often, uh, well, relatively often, we don't say very often, but relatively often, perhaps around 30 or 40% of the time, there is a name next to that uh, entry in the ledger. Now, all of this research that I had to do would have been uh, null and void. It would have been solved in one go by paying for the record if there had been a name against it. So, for example, you send off, you pay your uh, £20 or whatever it is uh, to get a copy of the uh, proof record, and that is the, um, the record they make when they proof the, the blade, um, and those have survived, although there are, some, there are some missing ones, and there are a few of the books have gone astray or been damaged by water or fire or whatever. So there aren't records for literally all blades, but there are for the vast majority of them, probably 90-95% of them. Um, but... Of those 90 or 90%-ish, um, only a, a fraction, say a, about a third, I think, have names attached to the records. And unfortunately, this one was a blank. It did not have a name next to the record. If it had, that would have been job done, but it didn't. So now I have to look to other methods for identifying who the officer was that owned this sword because the Wilkinson record won't tell me. So next up with this particular sword I was very lucky that I had initials in this case three initials uh, the letters of the of the name and you can see above the uh, initials here there are also two crests. Now usually if you get a crest there's only one crest but my experience has shown me that two crests usually means a double barreled name uh, or uh, a person which has, uh, shall we say, they've used a surname, usually the mother's maiden name, as a middle name. Okay, So usually those two crests will relate to two family names combined in the officer's name somehow, either a double, double barreled name or uh, one of the names being one of their middle names. Um, so at this point, I've now got initials and I've got crests. Now I've now got uh, two, actually three, really good resources to draw upon. First of all are the army lists. Now I use Hart's Annual Army Lists. You can Google these and you can access them on places like Archive. You can access them on uh, various other websites that host uh, PDF scans. Uh, sometimes from places like the British Library or sometimes from other just smaller libraries um, and they've put PDF scans up of the old original army lists. Now Hart's annual army list was as it sounds an annual army list of all the officers in the British Armed Forces and later in the Indian Armed Forces as well. Uh, before the uh, Indian Mutiny, the British Army and the Indian Army, the Indian Army was part of the Honourable East India Company, often just known as the East India Company. But 
after the Indian Mutiny, the East India Company was combined into the Queen's forces and therefore they also brought all of those officers from the Bengal Army and the Bombay Army and the Madras Army, they brought all of those officers onto Hart's annual army list. So after about 1860, you can see both British and Indian Army officers on the army list. Before the Indian Mutiny, you can only see the British Army on there. And if they're in the Indian Army, you have to look in something called the India Army List. But to summarise, there are army lists which list the names of all the officers by regiment. And in this case, we know it's a light cavalry regiment. So the first place we can start to look, um, uh, we'll talk about the crests in a second, but the first place we can start to look is in the army list. So the initials, which you can see uh, just down here, are kind of a whole kettle of fish of their own. And in fact, there are different, if we want to call them fonts or typefaces, that are used for etching those initials. And some of them are really difficult to decipher what the actual initials are. And sometimes, uh, for example, an S often looks more like a J to our eyes, but they are actually S's. So you need to familiarise yourself to some extent with Victorian, or in some cases Edwardian, or George V period, uh, kind of fonts or typefaces. Um, um, and uh, once you've done the uh, monograms and things like that, um, once you've done that, you can start to get a better eye for those initials. But in this particular case, it wasn't too difficult. It was the letters C, J, W. And they're, in this case, intertwined. And it wasn't particularly easy to tell which was the most prominent letter. In some cases, one of the letters is much bigger than the others. And that usually refers to the surname. So, for example, if I, my initials are M, J, E, if I was doing it in that style, I'd have a very big E and then a smaller M and J, for example. Um, but uh, in this case, it wasn't particularly clear uh, to see whether the, the J, the W or the C, they're, they're about the same size and they're intertwined and one isn't more bold than the other. So I was looking for a light cavalry officer with the initials JWC who was in the military this at the date of this blade. Additionally, of course, I had those crests. So if I did find any officer with uh, WJC as their initials, then I could cross-reference and look up those crests. Now, there are two good resources I use for searching for crests. The actual source uh, for looking at crests is what's called Fairbine's, um, well, there are various books, actually. There's Burke's General Armoury, but there's Fairbine's Book of Crests is the primary one. And there is a modern uh, service called My Family Silver. And if you go to the My Family Silver uh, website, you can actually search for crests related to surnames. So you type the surname in and it will show you all of the crests related to uh, that surname. Now, something very important to point out here is that just because you have a surname, I have the surname Easton, doesn't mean that I have the right to use a crest that I find on my family silver. There is a crest on there, or a couple maybe for Eastern, but they are not my family crest. They're some other branch of Easterns. In fact, a crest usually relates to one particular family or branch of family. So, for example, if you type a very common name into my family uh, crest, uh, my family silver rather, looking for a crest. If you type a common name like Smith or Jones or Clark, you'll get loads and loads of different crests. Okay, so when you're searching for this, if you find someone, let's say their surname was, um, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Withers. Okay, if their surname was Withers, you type Withers in there and you find five crests. So you've got to look through all of those crests and see if any of them relate to the crest that we have up here on the blade. So you can picture me, there I am looking through the army lists, looking for this combination of J and W and C. Um, and looking, cross-referencing when I ever find uh, a light cavalry officer that has a surname beginning with a J, a W or a C, I'm looking up for these crests and I'm looking, I'm preferably looking for an officer with a double-barreled surname as well. Now, relatively quickly on, I found that there was the surname Ward. Um, now, Ward did actually relate to one of these crests. Uh, and with a bit of time, I found that there was an officer with this surname Ward Jackson. And lo and behold, searching through the crests, I found that these two crests related to the names Ward and Jackson. So I had a double-barreled surname, Ward Jackson, Ward hyphen Jackson, and that seemed to relate to these crests. But the problem was, that officer that I could see in one of the regular light cavalry regiments did not have a first name which began with a C. 
So next I think, well, if the surname Ward Jackson is definitely correct for those crests and it matches my W and my J, I'm now looking for another Ward Jackson. Maybe he had a relative. Hmm, I'm thinking about this. Now I think, hold on, let's have a look in the yeomanry section. Now, what was yeomanry? Well, think about territorial army or reserves, um, home guard, this kind of thing. So in the Victorian period, it was quite popular to join the rifle volunteers or the artillery volunteers or the cavalry volunteers were known as the yeomanry. Now, in the army lists, the regular army takes up most of the book. And then at the back, non-indexed, I have to point out, unfortunately, are the reserves, the militia, the rifle volunteers, the yeomanry, and so on, the garrison artillery as well. So I went to the back, but I also used the search function because it's a PDF, so I did control F, and I searched for Ward Jackson, and boom, I found my guy. He was in the Yorkshire uh, Hussars, the Yorkshire Yeomanry, essentially, the reserve of the Yorkshire Hussars. Now, as it turned out, he was a very interesting guy. Although he was in the Yeomanry, he, uh, when the Boer War happened, he actually signed up, despite the fact he'd actually resigned by that point from the uh, Yeomanry, he um, signed up to join the, um, the forces, British forces going out to South Africa. He fought in the Boer War and um, he went on and served in World War I as well. And in fact, he was a po politician as well. Anyway, you can read the full blurb on him um, on my website linked below and I'll put a link directly to this sword. So you can see some clearer pictures of the crest and the initials and also uh, read about the guy if you're interested. But I hope that's been a useful and interesting summary in how I, in an ideal world, research uh, an antique sword. When I've kind of got everything playing in my favour, I know the model of sword, I know the regiment type, uh, you know, light cavalry or uh, infantry or whatever. Um, I've got a crest, in this case two crests, I've got initials, in this case three initials. I've got, it's a Wilkinson that's numbered so I know what year it was made. So I had everything in my favour and I found the guy and it turned out to be a very interesting guy. So this was kind of like a textbook example, but just to reiterate, I have got plenty of swords where I've just never managed to pin down the officer. Um, and I've got some swords that I'm currently working on at the moment where I think I probably will eventually get there, but it will require a lot more work. Um, I hope this has been interesting. Check out the links below. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, please do so and click on the notification bell as well um, for notifications for new videos, of course. And um, I will see you really soon again on Scholar Gladiatoria channel for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.